Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. And if you're remembering back to last week, we're actually just continuing on in the book of Matthew. Just an absolute coincidence, but kind of funny. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel to entangle him in his words. They sent their disciples to him with their inheritance, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God truthfully and are swayed by no one, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. They brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose, whose is this image and inscription? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they were amazed, and left him and went on their way. This is the word of God for the people of God. When we look at our scripture for today, we find Jesus walking among the people, as was his custom to do. He's entered the gates of Jerusalem at this point. And he's stopped by a group of Pharisees, and they ask him a simple question. Do you think it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Now, this question, when we look at it on its own, it can be viewed as something that's very innocent, right? A passing thing. Lord, do you think we should be paying taxes to Caesar? You're the Messiah. You're our teachers. You're our teacher. So should we be paying these taxes? But we need to consider what was going on in Jerusalem at the time. See, Jerusalem was under the rule of Roman law, under the Roman Empire, and the Israelites would have been expected to pay Caesar tribute each year in the form of their taxes. This is what the Roman Empire did. They conquered places, and then they took tribute from those places, generally allowing people to continue on as they are, as long as you pay your tribute to Caesar. And so they're a conquered people. They're living underneath this ever-growing oppressive government. And the Israelites are not happy, as you can imagine, to be having to live under the rule of others. After all, they are God's people. This land was promised to them. But here they find themselves under the rule of others. And as a result, there are many uprisings against Rome all of which are put down, and put down very violently. Now, as I said, it's custom for the people to pay their taxes to the Roman government. But there's another problem that can occur. When the Israelites are not able to pay their taxes in coin, the tax collectors go into the synagogues and take something of value and give that to the Romans to cover their taxes. So here we have a people paying taxes that most of them do not feel are just to the Romans who are oppressing them. And when they can't pay, they have the sanctity of their house of worship violated. So I want you to think about that in our terms. We don't necessarily agree with the way that the government's going. We still need to pay our taxes. We can't pay them for some reason. They come into the church and they decide, well, that piano looks like it's worth some money. We'll go ahead and take that. And then that's what covers our taxes for the year. Obviously, we would not be very happy with something like that occurring. So the, Pharise so the Pharisees expect that Jesus, who is claiming to be the Messiah of the Israelites, will say something like this when asked that question. No, you should not pay your taxes to Caesar. You should be driving him out and his people out of Jerusalem. Drive them out. And that's what they expect because they have been waiting for a Messiah that's going to lead them out of captivity in the same way that the kings of the past had done. The Pharisees were waiting on a great warrior to deliver them. And there were others that had claimed to be the Messiah, and each of them had tried to lead some sort of armed rebellion that was put down by the Romans. And not only do the Pharisees think Jesus is going to respond this way and tell the people to rebel, but they want him to respond that way. 
They want him to respond that way because if he declares something like that, we need to get the Romans out of here. Do not pay them their taxes. They're going to have the evidence that they need to take him before Pontius Pilate for trying to incite an insurrection. And so the Pharisees go as far as to flatter him before asking him the question, calling him teacher or rabbi in different versions, telling him, we know that you always tell us the truth. So, tell us the truth now. But Jesus doesn't fall for their wickedness. So he does not give them the answer they are looking for. Instead, he tells them, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You see this coin? It is his image. Give it back to him. And give unto God what is God's. And then hearing this, they go away amazed. And I like to think it went something like this. Oh man, I have a great idea to trick Jesus. We're going to get him to say something that's going to get him in trouble. And then that way we're going to get rid of him. Man, I am so clever. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to butter him up real good. I'm going to go to him and I'm going to say, Teacher, oh, that's good. Yep, he's above me, teacher. Make him think that. I'm going to tell him, oh, you always tell the truth. I know you're going to tell me the truth this time too because you're not concerned about the law of persons. And then I'm going to spring my trap on him and bam, we've got him. So that Pharisee goes, asks the question. Jesus responds to him and he probably feels about like this. Oh, what's that, Jesus? Oh, Give unto Caesar what is his, and in God what is God's? Oh, uh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Y- you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go tell some other people what you told us, because that, that, that's pretty good. Man, I really thought I had him. I was going to get him. All right? So now often, when we look at this scripture, it's used by Christians and by non-Christians alike, to justify things like paying your taxes. Or it's used, again, by Christians and non-Christians alike to justify supporting a government, whether it be a good or bad. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you otherwise that you don't need to pay your taxes, so sorry if you thought that's what you were going to get out of this morning. It won't happen. Even more important, I think, right now, I'm not going to stand up here and debate the political aspect of this scripture because I'm guessing everyone is getting plenty of political debate elsewhere in their lives right now. So what I do want to focus in on today is the words that Jesus speaks. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. So if we've established that to give our taxes unto Caesar is what we are to do, then what else is left? What is God's? Well, when you think about it, everything else is left. And I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to get across here. And I think we need to <clears throat> consider that how the point gets made in Scripture and can be applied to the li- our life now as well. See, I think some people today like to replace the part, that first part, of give unto Caesar with themselves. So in our modern world, I think it would go something more like this. Give unto Eric what is Eric's. And give unto God what is God's. But I think we can find ourselves, and we may find others saying it more like this. Give unto Eric what is Eric's. And give unto God what is God's. So we are human after all, and it is easy for us to find ourselves focusing on only what we believe is ours. Trying to gain more for ourselves and trying to protect the things that we feel are rightfully ours. This is not what God wants from us. One of my least favorite games, least favorite games, to play with my children is called Guess Who Had the Toy First? Now, if you're unfamiliar with this game, I will enlighten you. This is how it goes. Child number one. Dad, they stole my toy. Child number two. Nuh-uh, I had it first. Child number one. No, I had it first. 
Child number two. Well, it doesn't matter if you had it first because it's my toy and I want it back now. This leads to me saying, okay, which one of you had it first? Now, there is no way of me actually knowing who had that toy first. And the only way I could ever figure it out is that I get to try to piece together the mystery and then make my decision on that that way. Or, as is my usual response to this game, I don't care who had it first, and I don't care whose toy it is. If you can't find a way to share with one another, then I'm going to have that toy, and it'll be mine. And I'm sure you've seen this with kids before. They really get attached to something, and it is a struggle to get them to see that sharing that toy, or whatever it may be, is much more important than who owns it. Let us look at this in an adult world and think of it in this way. Have you ever had the misfortune of watching two adults fight over a parking space at the store? Because I am sure that none of us here have ever been the adult that fought over that parking space, right? So we're going to take it as we're looking at other people. Hey, buddy, that is my spot. I was here first. No, I was here first. I had my turn signal on. I was waiting for them to pull out. No, you just pulled them as fast as you could and you stole my spot. Well, when you think about it, that parking spot doesn't belong to either of them. It belongs to the company that owns the parking lot. Their occupation of that spot is only temporary. Well, we get so wrapped up in trying to protect what we think is ours that we forget that it couldn't possibly matter in the least. So the real important thing for us to remember is that we need to give unto God what is God's. So what is God's? As we said earlier, the answer is everything. But what does that mean for us? Well, let's think about it in these terms. We are the children of God. We are his. So what can we make sure to do that we are giving him what is properly his? We need to be giving him our time. After all, it's really his. We need to be giving our minds to God. And we do this by studying his scriptures and by making sure that we keep our thoughts pure. We need to be giving our blessings to God. You know, in the doxology that we sing every week, we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. So if they flow from God, then they are his to begin with. And we give him our blessings by offering our tithes and by making sure that we are sharing and taking care of our neighbors and being blessings to all that we meet. We need to be giving our service to God. After all, he serves us in so many ways in our lives. Shouldn't we be doing the same for him in his name? And finally, if you haven't done so already, you need to give your heart to God. After all, it is his. He placed it in your chest. He caused it to beat. And he formed you and made you in his own image. You are his child and he wants you to give him your heart freely and with joy. So let us do our best always to give unto God what is God's. My challenges for you this week, are you giving God what is his? Think about it. And what is one way that you can improve upon what you're giving to God? Amen.